Thank you very much, and also thank you, uh, Mick Finch, for inviting me. Um, this has been a fantastic uh, conference, uh, a lot to think about. Um, in a way, I'm going to come back round to the beginning in a kind of repetition. In the end, um, I'm going to talk more about theatricality than about perversion, uh, which was in my title. So I hope you're not too disappointed. Um, if I begin with a slide of a tableau vivant rather than a tableau proper, it's because when one says that the tableau vivant has nothing to do with the tableau, it sounds to me like an act of denegation, in which case the tableau vivant inevitably returns to the tableau as, as it were, its outside on its inside. Whether in the form of painting or photograph, the tableau has been and continues to be taken as a condition for beholding uh, by Michael Fried, which has a complex relation to theater, as we've heard, and also to anti-theatricality. In this way, he has deepened the modernist account of the material conditions and conventions of each art form to include the question of how we are in presence, how beholding is even possible in the first place, and how the tableau allows it to be possible, makes it possible. Theatricality would be, to use Heideggerian terms, something like the Vorstellung, the setting up of the world before us uh, as a picture um, that conceals and forgets presencing. So the now has something to do with the dispositif or gestell, the setup of an age. But of course, concealment and forgetting are a part of presencing itself. And remember what we've heard from Philip Armstrong about Darstellung, presentation as such. So the tableau can't simply be untheatrical or anti-theatrical, a positive alternative to theater that somehow leaves it behind, but rather a turning, and uh, Philip also talked about turning, a movement from one kind of presence to another, an anti-theatrical movement that paradoxically needs to be re-enacted. So I want to argue theater returns. It has to return. Jean-Francois Chevrier, in a brilliant paper in a recent conference at, in uh, Łódź in Poland on the painter Straminski, which he has uh, reiterated uh, part of uh, today, argued for the de-dramatization of the tableau. He argues that what is at stake in this de-dramatization is the painting as a pacification of the evil eye. So following the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, an assuaging of the gaze of the big other. Here it is a case of the relation of beholding to being beheld, the being in the gaze that is a condition of looking, the source of which one does not see. The gaze can turn malign and demanding, even horrifying, situating the viewer as a subject of its desire, its avariciousness. What does it want of me? Effectively, the gaze turns the spotlight on the subject who is thus placed on stage in a theater of cruelty. The painting, by diverting or pacifying the gaze, saves the subject from its harsh light. Detheatricalization is therefore a kind of salvation hence its ecstatic character. The question we might pose here is what kind of theater is involved that needs to be de-theatricalized or de-dramatized? Um, is it to be, in the, is to be in the condition of theater necessarily to be under the evil eye? So what I want to make some remarks about today is the tableau as theater, and to do so in relation to two questions. First, is there theatricality inherent to the tableau as a historical form? Second, if the tableau as interpreted by Michael Fried and Jean-François Jean Chevrier involves a turn away from theater, whether for the same or different reasons, can we speak of a re-theatricalization of the tableau, or more precisely, of a re-potentialization of the theatricality inherent to the tableau? 
Finally, we will need to consider the implications of these questions for how the tableau in its theatricality or otherwise relates to the co-possibilities of presencing and sociality in our world. To get there, I'm going to consider the tableau in relation to the work of three artists, Pierre Klosowski, James Coleman, and Marcel Brotas, and consider with some remarks and con conclude with some remarks based on a recent account of theatricality in Denis Diderot. I want to begin by showing you two clips from a film that the late great Chilean director Raul Ruiz, living in exile in Paris, made in 1979 with Pierre Klosowski, who participated in the writing of the script. It actually apparently began as a project uh, commissioned by TV for a documentary on Klosowski and turned essentially into a collaborative work between Ruiz and Klosowski. Okay, can we see the clip, please? Okay, can we go back to the slide then? Um, the film has, <clears throat> as you will have seen, not one but two narrators. A narrator in the film who is an art collector, connoisseur, elderly intellectual. Uh, I think there's an element uh, by Ruiz of uh, parody of um, kind of aging white males pontificating on the tableau. I, of course, uh, include myself. And a second narrator... Um, who is a, a voiceover. The plot revolves around seven tableau by an academic painter named Tonnerre, one of which is missing. These paintings in turn relate to a scandalous ritual that has taken place. Um, so a, a mystery or enigma is established to which the interpretation of the tableau may or may not provide the key. Of course, since one tableau is missing, the interpretation can never be definitive. It might always be contradicted by the missing tableau. And it is this very incompleteness, this void, this non-presence that drives the movement of the narrative. As you can see from what you've seen and from this far too cursory description, we have several layers of framing. The voiceover narrator frames the narrator in the image who in turn frames the tableau which are themselves framed representations. However, this hierarchical structure constantly reverses or inverts itself. The English title of the film is The Hypothesis of the Stolen Painting. That's what it's translated as, but that, that's not quite right. It should be tableau, not painting, because the film comprises a series of tableau vivant, actors' bodies, reconstructing paintings. The inversions of theatrical framing take place through the tableau vivant as narrator walks into the picture which now frames him. This is effectively a kind of proto-installation art within the film. And insofar as this is a film, a temporal medium in which sometimes the actors of the tableau move, the question is raised of the relation of the tableau in its stillness to time. And you saw a shot uh, the tableau being held quite still on Diana for a while, um, suggesting the stillness within the moving film. Um, the relation of the tableau to its stillness, of, in its stillness to time and to manifestation. Specifically, what is the relation of that which manifests itself to what Klosowski, drawing on Roman image theory elsewhere, calls the simulacrum, and the relation of that which is singular, the enigma, to that which is exchangeable in the common, in the, um, common currency of the stereotype. To... Uh, um, move on to the uh, topic of the tableau vivant that you saw. Uh, Klosowski uh, also wrote a book, uh, title translates to Diana uh, at her bath, which was first published in French in 1956 and is also about beholding. What may have taken place is a theophany, a manifestation of the goddess, Artemis in Greek, Diana for the Romans. And I quote uh, uh, Klosowski, Look not at Artemis face to face, or you will vanish under her gaze. For if her entire body is visible, it is I myself who envelop her essence. Only her gaze I cannot veil. For the rest of you it means death. On the other hand, contemplate her askance, if you can, or in profile. 
but preferably from behind. As one might add, God said to Moses in Exodus. Condensed here is the Greek aletheia, literally unforgetting, manifestation as unconcealment, with the Roman simulacrum and the monotheist afterglow or trace of God. We could say that between aletheia and trace, between Greek and Judeo-Christian manifestation and non-manifestation is theater, Roman simulacrum. And the simulacrum is precisely a between, the work of a mediator, a demon, as Klosowski calls it. In their encounter, Acteon and Diana are at once absolutely proximate and absolutely distant. I quote Klosowski, Acteon's distance with respect to Diana is as absolute as their contact is sudden and immediate. Between their reciprocal distance and their contact, there is nothing, end of quote. Into this nothing is interposed an intermediary demon, and I quote, this demon, because he is neither God nor man, but as it were the reflection of one in the other, himself excluded from the mythic world, um, inaugurates from his intermediary position the manner of seeing and judging of the theologians and metaphysicians, end of quote. The theophany is double, Christian metaphysical on the one hand, pagan on the other. And I quote, the theophany of Diana at her bath thus has a twofold effect. As light emanating from the divine principle, it suspends time and time's reflection. The space of myth then encompasses Acteon and his metamorphosis into a stag takes place, end of quote. Titian's two paintings show the stasis of the revelation and the metamorphosis in process. Of course, the story is from Ovid. Acteon with a stag's head and a human's body as his hounds are about to tear him to pieces, his own hounds. We might notice that the still reflecting pool in which Diana was about to bathe becomes in the second painting the turbulent flow of the river, image and time. The movement is double. Walking about, Acteon bursts into the mythic space of Diana and receives a theophany. But, Klosowski writes, and I quote, this same theophany, this same manifestation of the god, traverses the mythic space, and the very pool-bathing Diana then reveals itself to be the mirror of her impalpable nudity. Diana reflects, reabsorbs into her principle her momentarily radiated nudity, end of quote. It is in the double movement of theophantic encounter, seeing the goddess on the one hand, and reflection coupled with withdrawal on the other, that the bifurcated character of the image of sim as simulacrum becomes apparent. One si uh, on one side, the image makes manifest, it shows, and on the other side, it is a trace of withdrawal, the reabsorption of the reflection into its principle as a metaphysical structure. If this account of Diana and Acteon sounds something like an allegory, Klosowski places it within a frame that de-allegorizes it, insofar as it shows the incompatibility of seeing and saying. Um, and I quote, Acteon in the myth sees because he cannot say what he sees. If he could say it, he would no longer see, end of quote. The theophany, after all, turns him into a dumb animal. But Klosowski adds, and I quote, the real experience, however, would boil down to an absurd proposition. I was supposed to be here because I was not supposed to be here, end of quote. It is because of the prohibition that we see, a proposition that is not only absurd but also perverse. This has nothing to do with the peephole, with seeing without being seen. Acteon is seen and cannot escape. Perhaps he should have thrown something down to placate the goddess, or at least distract her from the chase. Perhaps that is what, as Darian Leader suggests in his book, Stealing the Mona Lisa, what art stops us from seeing, the work of art is for the artist. Old Titian making a painting of the destruction of the one who, have seen for the, uh, one who has seen for the pacification of the evil eye to return to that notion. The tableau here has a, and I'm sliding a little bit, I know, between tableau and image, but I can come back to that. 
um, <coughs> which are, of course, not exactly the same thing, but I would argue are not exactly separable either. The tableau here has a double function, to manifest and to show the withdrawal of the manifestation, so that it is, is at once the pure, unique, indeed singular event of presence and conventional sign. We can see this happening in the tableau when an abstract painting becomes a sign of itself. A. Malevich, A. Kandinsky, A. Mondrian, A. Pollock. What does this tell us about the tableau? Klosowski's three Robert books were published in the years surrounding Diana at her bath, and effectively they frame each other. These three books, Robert Ce Soir, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and Le Souffleur, together with the uh, uh, book Le Baphomet, which um, to a certain extent informs the images of the hypothesis of the stolen painting, provide the material for Klosowski's own drawings. And around 1965, this great novelist, translator, and philosopher gave up writing for mainly making large drawings of perverse scenarios using colored pencils, drawings that, while very beautiful, are by no means facile, but rather awkward, clumsy, a little cliched, and already slightly dated when they were made. 